today usually um, I I go I always try to remember to acknowledge that there are people that are following us on on YouTube but basically my ministry is to the people who I'm face to face um, with and so today it's like I'm really talking to my family the people that I I, I know I want to start um, in Joshua the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 7. I appreciate everyone and I often pray for the Most High to help me to examine myself, to examine my heart, to make sure there's no darkness in me. And so, um, because I, I love the Most High, I love His people, I love my family. And I don't have any bitterness on, in my heart that I know of towards anyone. Because I understand that vengeance belongs to the Lord. And I'm grateful for that type of mind or heart set. But if you believe in the Creator, if you believe that He sent His Son to die for you, you shouldn't just be concerned for you. You, sh you should always be concerned for the people who he's allowed to be in your, in your life. And so I'm going to start in the Old Testament in the book of Joshua. And I don't have a lot today because I do want to speak to you all off camera as I started before the camera started. And I apologize for those of you who do tap into these videos. Um, again, the primary focus of the videos is not me sitting in front of a camera. I'm doing a video to post on YouTube that we have a small ministry of people that we know. We know because the scripture, and I'm going to go there. The scripture, Thessalonians says that we're supposed to know the people who you labor among, so that you can know the character of the people, you can know the lifestyle of the people, and that you can be held accountable. It's, you, you, we're supposed to be a small enough or an intimate enough group of people that you are familiar with the people's lifestyle and that helps that is supposed to help bring some level of accountability and security and safety um, for for the believer that's that's what it's supposed to be for we supposed to look out for each other in prayer and support and um, admonishment whatever it is if you don't know the people then you're not able to encourage or admonish them other than if if the Holy Spirit just happened to lead you to a video that's talking about something that God is highlighting in your life. Okay. So in chapter 7 of um, Joshua, you want, it, the, the subtitle of this in my Bible is The Sin of Achan. Some people call it a con. And I always knew it as Achan. Verse 1 it says, But the children of Israel, listen to this closely. The children of Israel committed a trespass in a cursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Now listen, one man did something, but... The anger of the Lord was kindled against all of them. Do you see that? And so this is when we don't follow, excuse me, when we don't follow the instructions. God gives us instructions not to punish us or to hurt us or to be mean or restrictive. He gives us instructions in order to protect us and to help us to not be open to the evil that's in the world. Because he said he would never leave us nor forsake us and he wouldn't leave us as orphans. So one person did something, but it had an effect on everyone. And that same principle is at work today. Okay, now let's drop down to verse 17, same chapter. It says, and he brought the family of Judah, and he took the family of the Zarhites, and he brought the family of the Zarhites, man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And he brought his household, man by man, 
And Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, was taken. So now Joshua is going through the camp trying to find out. You can go back and read the whole story. I'm fast forwarding it. He's going through the camp to try to find out where the sin is because they went to battle with a few men and Ai thinking that they were going to be able to defeat them because God had already helped them to defeat uh, other people that they had gone up against. But now, before there was no sin in the camp, but now there's sin in the camp. And because of the sin in the camp, they were defeated. So now the Lord has already revealed to Joshua that there's sin in the camp. So they're going through each tribe group to see where the sin is. So they found out that the sin is with verse 18. It says, and he brought his household man by man. And Achan, the son of Kami, the son of Zabdi, and the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah was taken. So that's where the sin was found. And Joshua said unto Achan, my son, Give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord or to the Most High of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. Hiding your sin does not help you. Staying in your sin does not just affect you, but it affects everyone that you're in fellowship with if you are a believer in Christ. And the difference in what we are getting ready to read about versus law and grace is that under the law, this is what would happen to people. And if this, if this law was still being practiced, and in some places it is still being practiced in some places in the world, when you are caught doing something that the Most High has told you not to do, you... People are not operating under the grace. And like I shared with you off camera, when I was a kid, people were afraid of God. People honored God. People were afraid of sin. Women were afraid to get pregnant out of wedlock because they were, it was, they were shunned upon. It was something to be ashamed of. So much that that's why they made, they passed abortion laws. Because people would, would, would sneak and have abortions outside. They made it legal because they claimed that people was dying from having illegal abortions, which they shouldn't have never been having in the first place. But that was their way of covering up their sin and not bringing shame upon upon themselves and their family. It was it was considered profanity. And I'm just saying, I grew up in the South, so, and I'm, I'm not ashamed of my age. I'm grateful that God has given me this long to live. But you couldn't even, in my culture, where I grew up, say the word pregnant. That was, that was something you, you just couldn't say. I'm just saying, this is how far we've taken grace and moved away from anything that is holy or righteous. Okay? So in verse 20... Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Most High of Israel. And thus and thus have I done. So he's saying what he's telling all what he's done. He's, he says, When I saw among the spoils a godly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them. See that word coveted? Underline and circle the word covet because covet is still in the, in the, in the, under the New Testament is something that is, is an abomination to God. And took them and behold they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran unto the tent and behold, it was hid. See, anything hid. We're supposed to walk in the light because we are children of the light. And that was another scripture I had meant to share with you all last week that we are God's lights. And if we have darkness in us and we are walking in sin and then we say we belong to him, we make him a liar. And it's like what Christ did for us was of non-effect. Because we don't change. So in verse 22, of Joshua sent messengers, and they ran unto the tent. And behold, it was hid in his tent. 
and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and unto all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Most High. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, and his, his donkeys, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them in, unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? See, why hast thou why you Achan brought this sin unto all of us? Because you can't win any battles against darkness if you have sin in your life. You just can't win. Because you give the enemy a legal right, legal access to you. The Most High shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel, all Israel stoned him with stones and burn them with fire because that's what they were supposed to do when they went and they, they they spoiled the city that he took that stuff from. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Most High turned. Once they got, same thing happened with Jonah. Once they got rid of what was causing the problem, the Most High turned from fierceness of his anger. Wherefore, the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. Okay? So, I was telling you we're supposed to know the people who we labor among. Let's, let me show you that in Scripture. Most, almost everything I say, I try to show it to you in Scripture. So, it's not just my opinion. It's Scripture. And the Scripture says that we all... All of us have fallen short. The thing is to confess your sin and repent. And I'm going to get into all of that a little bit if God is willing. First Thessalonians chapter 5. And let's start at verse 8. We're living in some perilous times. And we have to have faith and trust. And at times, the persecutions, the tribulations, the afflictions is so, so difficult. But we are in a period of time where we're supposed to be examining ourselves to make sure that we are not in sin. And we can't justify our sins and make excuses for your sins and hide your sins. The scripture says your sin will find you out. It will find you out. You can't hide from it. Whatsoever sees you sow, you're going to reap. And usually the harvest is greater than what you sow. And I'm, I find myself week after week after week saying this. And people listen to you, but they continue to do their same old sins. They continue to lie, to steal, cheat, commit adultery and fornication. And then they say, Lord, forgive me. They know before they do it that it's wrong, but they keep on doing it anyway. And that's not repentance. Repentance means I'm really genuinely sorry. I feel grief in my heart for the for what I did. I I I my I came to the understanding. God revealed it to me how bad it is that act I committed. How 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 egregious it was. It was bad, and I feel sorry, and I feel dirty and grieved. I feel bad. That's what repentance is. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I, I did this. And if I could go back to a period of time in history and undo that act or that thing what I've done, I would go back and, and, and I would do it differently. That's what repentance is. Repentance is not I'm going to do this um, act on Tuesday because, and then I'm going to ask for forgiveness on Wednesday and then I'm, I feel good again. That, that, you, you can't, that's not it. And if you're in a group of people and that's how you live and you're putting the rest of them at risk because they're standing with you against you opening them up just like Achan opened the children of Israel up to, to being destroyed. But God is merciful for us today 
and, a, and, and his how he deals with us, us today is different from how he dealt with Aiken's pe period of time in history. But his standard of holiness is still the same. And so you can't continue to hide the sin and not confess the sin or not get before the Lord and ask him to reveal to you where you are feeling it, where, where there's unconfessed sin, where is there darkness in your heart. You got to get right with God because if you don't have God on your side, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh to lead you into all truth and to guide you and to comfort you and to protect you, we are living in some times that do, and I know I'm saying the same things to you week after week after week because it's a reality of most people is that witches and warlocks and technology is coming against the people of the Most High who are trying to do the right thing. So it's even more imperative that you don't pretend to be doing right and then not be doing right. Because the enemy is going to come against you either way. But at least if, you, if you're doing it right, you have a fighting chance. You have a fighting chance. You have, you have hope in Christ that he's going to help, help you to make it to the other side standing. But if you got sin in your life, you, all of the people who's with you, is, you're putting them at risk of being hurt, of being destroyed. Am I making sense? All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8 said, But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. That whether we wake, whether we dead, <laughs> whether we are alive or asleep, that's what wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. Edify one another. Edify means to build each other up, to comfort each other, even as also you do. And we beseech you, brethren. Let me give you the definition of beseech. Beseech means something that is urgent, fervent. Remember, fervent means heated, intense, very important, vague. And urgent means requiring immediate attention. I, I, I like to break it down so you get a good understanding of what the scripture is saying. It's something that needs to be done immediately. It's urgent. It, and he's begging. And he's putting emphasis on how important it is to know them which labor among you and, oh, and, and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. you you're supposed to know the people. And you get to know them by having fellowship with them, being with them over a period of time. It's not somebody who you just meet today and you knew them for a couple of months and then you, you like their personality and you, you only with them a few times a week or a couple of hours. You don't know somebody like that. And you don't know them in a church. If you're in a mega church and you only see them once a week or twice a week and you have no intimate, and when I say intimate, I don't mean like an intimate man and woman type thing. I mean like a close having a meal. I'm going to your house. I get to, I know your lifestyle. I, I know, I know what you stand for. I know that you, you, you walk out what you say you believe. You don't get that in a mega church. And you don't get that in a short period of time. It takes time to develop and cultivate. The children of Israel lived in tribes. So they knew each other because they came from the same family lineage. Or they knew each other's tribes. They knew each other. They had close association with each other. They, they worked together. They built together. They did everything together. That was God. Remember, we, we can't go by everything that people did that was sinful. Because Achan was a good example of 
it's in the Bible. He did something he wasn't supposed to do, but that doesn't mean because he did it that God was okay with him doing it. It's placed in here to see his failure, to see what not to do. So not everything is for us to do, but the things that God shows us is so that we wouldn't fall victim to the same things that the people of old did. So we should know who we labor among. If you have a prayer ministry and it's open to everybody to come for prayer, when you pray for people, you shouldn't have the new people who you don't even know praying about the people who you're supposed to be praying for because you're putting the people's information at risk to people who you don't know. In ministry, if someone comes and speaks to you confidentially that something that they're struggling with, you're not supposed to broadcast whatever it is that they're struggling with. You're supposed to listen as unto the Lord. To comfort them, to edify them, to build them up. And you're supposed to have patience with people. Patience is one of the fruit of the Spirit. And it's not for a lady or a man. It's for everyone who believes in Christ. It's the fruit of the Spirit to take time to build people up, to comfort them, to, to, to love them. Love is kind. Remember 1 Corinthians 12, 13 tells us what love is all about. And that's an instruction to God's body, to his believers. Am I making sense to you all today? So it's important to know the people who you're laboring among. Because if you're laboring among somebody who is a believer who say that they are a believer and they are not living it. They put the whole group of people at risk. And our ministry is, was a lot bigger than it is now, but God had told me to get some people to, to, to tell some people that they had to leave because they were constantly causing confusion and stirring up issues and they had been told enough information about God and the Word of God that if they wanted to change that they had an opportunity from what was given to them to change. And there was somebody else, based on scripture, that I should have asked to leave, but I didn't because I felt that the person would have been destroyed if I had told them to leave. And God didn't tell me to tell them to leave, but scripturally, I should have asked them to leave. But what I did was I talked to them and told them that their lifestyle was wrong and it was sinful and I was not embracing it or endorsing it. Am I making sense to you? All right. Let's turn to um, 1 Corinthians. And I, nobody should be condemned or feel condemned if they have sinned and confessed that sin and genuinely repented and turned away from it because God is a forgiving God and he's a loving God and he's operating and has extended grace to us. That's what Jesus came to establish in the earth was grace because God understood that the laws was placed in place to help us to understand a boundary of what sin was until grace came. But we still do not have a license to sin. We still suppose that the same standard of holiness and righteousness applies in the, in, the, in the world. It's just God gives us some time to get it right, but not forever. And God forbid if you die in your sin. No telling, I couldn't say what's going to happen to you. Because he gives us an opportunity to repent. But 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's look at verse 9. It says, um, 
I wrote unto you, and this is Paul speaking, he says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with fornicators of this world, or with covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then much you need to go out of the world. He is saying, he's not telling you not to have anything to do with people who are unsaved that are committing these these sins. Because if, if that was the case, you would have to leave the world because a lot of people who's not trying to live for, for the Most High is committing these sins and you don't have any control over those people. So it says, but in verse 11, but now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or a covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such a one don't even have a don't even go out to lunch or eat with that kind of person do you understand what I'm saying this is the standard because of what happened with Aiken this is our standard how we're supposed to be today that's why it's important to know the lifestyle and the people who you fellowship and labor among that if they're committing these things you're supposed to be able to tell them you're not welcome to be in our fellowship anymore. You have to come out. You, you come back once you've decided that you're going to repent. Because repent means to change your heart and your mind. That I feel so sorry, Lord, that I've, I've committed this act. And I, I want my life to go on a different course. I don't want to continue to um, have one night stands. I don't want to continue to sleep with somebody I'm not married to. I'm not going to continue to be telling lies. Or I'm not going to continue to get drunk and, and be a, a reveler and do all the things that I understand biblically. If I'm a believer, if I see if I say I'm a believer, that means I carry the presence and the power of God in me. And my presence, that light in me, just my presence, should have the ability to, to shift darkness when I enter into a space without me saying anything. And you can know that that's taking place because your presence makes people uncomfortable. They don't like you. They don't have a tangible or any experiential reasons for not liking you. They just don't like you because you were there. Because you have the power and the presence of God in you and that makes them uncomfortable. But if you're continuing to do all of these things and then you say you believe in, you, you, are, you are a brother or you are a believer in Christ, you are affecting the whole body in an adverse way. Especially the people who you're fellowshipping with. Because they're supposed to know you well enough to know your lifestyle and to know you and to hold you accountable for your shortcomings and your sins to help edify you and build you up and create an environment of holiness that you won't be comfortable continuing in your sin. And we're supposed to take this serious. It's important. And because we have not taken it serious and it has not been taught, People don't have any, don't place any value on it. And sin now is rampant. And darkness is rampant. And people are leaving what they have thought to be a walk with God and fully embracing Satanism. Because they see power in Satanism. They see a, they see a tangible manifestation of power. They don't know anything about how to walk by faith. They don't understand persecution, tribulation, molding and shaping. God uses persecution and molding and shaping sometimes, um, uh, persecution and afflictions to mold and shape us and build our character. If we'll stay faithful while we're going through. If we'll resist doing some of the things we, our flesh is telling us to do. Am I making sense to you all today? We're supposed to know the people who we labor among. Okay, um, I want to turn to um, Romans 6. And let's look at verse 
16. Romans 6. Verse 16 says, Know you not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey? His servants you are to whom you obey. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So if you serve in sin, you 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 serving, you you leading your soul to death. Remember, everything, I want to emphasize this, everything is about your soul. The enemy wants your soul. Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, came to redeem, ransom, pay back, buy back through the shedding of his blood, the opportunity for your soul to be saved and ransomed and quickened back to the Father. So it's about your soul. So this scripture is saying, if you serve sin or you obeying sin, then sin is going to lead you to death. But if you obey God's way of living, then you get righteousness. It says, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. This should be your testimony that you were the servant of sin. But you have obeyed from the heart. See? You have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Like the people in the world I just read to you, you, they're free to do all of those things. What fruit have you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. The things that you now do that you would be ashamed of is death. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be caught up in those things anymore, that what you used to be and do. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness. You should have fruit that represents holiness. And the end is everlasting life. For I came, I came all the way from there to bring you here. The wages of sin. Sin pays a cost or gives, gives you a wage, gives you a salary, gives you a payment. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God through Christ is eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Yeshua HaMashiach. For those who cannot tolerate the name that got you saved or got you aware of, of, of the existence of the Most High. It's not the picture of a person. It's the name. The name that is above all names. Let's turn to Acts. Did I take you to 2 Corinthians 7? Okay, let's go there then. Thank you, Father. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And let's start at verse 5. The word repent um, in Greek is, is, is word number 3341. And it means the, the true repent, repentance is a genuine sorrow for your sin. I've already shared that with you, but I want to read these verses of scripture. Chapter 7, <coughs> verse 5 says, For when we were, this is Paul speaking, he says, For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. But we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings. Within were fears. <coughs> Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you 
when he told us your earnest desire. This is, I'm getting ready to read to you what it looks like when people truly repent. Your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle has made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you, but that you sorrowed to repentance. You see, he wrote them a letter telling them about their sin. And the letter was harsh enough that they repented because they were able to... Re this is why you're supposed to tell people about what they're not doing right. Because it gives them an opportunity to, to check themselves or to think about what you say. But you can't do that to people who you don't know. It says, for you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us and nothing. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation not to be repented of but the sorrow of the world works death you see do you understand what i'm saying for behold this self same thing that you that you sorry after a godly sought what carefulness it wrought in you yeah what clearing of yourselves this is the need to be a clearing of yourselves Yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, what zeal, what revenge. In all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did, did it not for this cause that had done the wrong, nor for the, his cause that suffered wrong, but that I'll care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. So, you suppose that... Let people know what you're doing is not right. And if the person is genuinely a believer in Christ, they're going to receive what you say and they're going to genuinely have sorrow and have a time of repentance. And so we need to examine ourselves. These feast times is a time of appointed times to meet with the Most High to give you an opportunity to examine yourselves. I, I haven't on purpose talked or gotten a lot into it because there's so much controversy about it. But you, we all, I've taught many other times on, on the different Feast of Trumpets and the, um, the Atonement and all of the various times. But we know that this is a time. And um, one of the reasons why I don't get deeply into it is because the Israelites is not Jews. And the Jews have taken the Israelites' doctrine and, and developed their own times of feasts. So turning back to the Father in terms of having the observance of the feast times, I don't want to do it on a time because it's somebody else's time. But I understand that it's a more deed. It's a time of appointment that we're supposed to meet with the Most High. And it's supposed to be the fall time and the spring time and the different times. And we're supposed to know those times by understanding this, this, the signs in the sky. You understand what I'm saying? But sin is something we should, we should want to deal with all the time to make sure that every day that we are walking uprightly before the Most High. And this message or teaching is to send a strong urgent message for people who hear this message or teaching to please look deep within yourselves get before the most high and make sure that there's no sin willful sin against God and it's not meant to bring any condemnation on anyone because no one has ever lived other than Christ that lived a life that they did not sin and thank God that we don't live in a culture today where our sin um, um, wage would be stoning. But you still have to worry about your soul. And the enemy is trying really, really hard to discourage people and to cause them to move away from their faith and their belief and their confidence in the power of the Most High God. And he's trying to bring condemnation onto people. But if you are not if you know you don't have any known sin in your life, the condemnation can't stick. And you will be able to continue to stand with the full armor of God on you, believing and trusting somehow, some way, 
He's going to help you to make it to the other side. And today might be my day to be sorrowful, to be sad, to be discouraged. But if I'm with a group of people, then those group of people should be able to build me up, edify me, bring me comfort. And tomorrow might be my time to build you up, to bring you comfort. That's what the body is supposed to do for each other. Not tear each other down or run away from each other, but build each other up. Encourage each other and stand with, e with each other. That's why there should be no sin. Because you should love your sister or brother enough to not put them at risk to be standing with you knowing that you are committing sin. Am I making sense to you? That's what love is. And that's what we have to go deep within ourselves and start the practice. That we love you, each other, enough to not put you at risk for something I've done wrong like what Achan did. Achan put the whole camp of Israel at risk over greed and idolatry and covetousness and selfishness. Because he had no idea where the Most High was taking all of the children of Israel. And through whatever he was, wherever he was taking them, he was testing them too. And building up character in them along the way. This is why it's important to not compromise. But to stay strong in the power of his might. With his full armor on each and every one of us every day. Okay? Alright, let's have communion.